Okay. Um, welcome everybody to another session of the FRCS Mentor uh, presentation. Um, as always, today we'll have a talk and then afterwards we'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our presenter and then after that we will do our Viva session, which is the unrecorded part of this session. So if you are watching this on YouTube, please do contact us if you want to be uh, involved uh, on the, in these sessions more directly. Um, and we can add you to the, uh, or you can log on to go to the web page if you to have uh, one of our newest mentors, uh, Mustafa Rashid. He's uh, uh, some fresh blood, and we're really looking forward to his talk. He's going to talk to us about uh, shoulders, and he's a post CCT in Writington uh, fellow. Um, uh, and, uh, and I know his uh, talk is going to be perfect for your preparation for the FRCS exam. Uh, without much more com comments from me, um, Rashid, it's really, uh, Mustafa, Rashid, it's nice to see you. Great, thank you, uh, uh, Sean. So Mustafa, one of the uh, uh, post-CCT shoulder fellows at Wrightons and Hospital. Um, I did the FRCS last year uh, during uh, the COVID uh, madness, and I recently did the EBOT exam. Um, but this, this talk is mainly geared towards the FRCS, but if anyone has any questions or would like to know a bit more about the difference between the two, uh, um, please feel free to email me at the end. Okay, so I'm just basically going to cover um, shoulder cases in particular, some intermediate cases, some short cases, some vibers, and then after the um, the recorded talk, there'll be the, 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 the session to um, to do that have some viber practice. Um, so I'm just going to get stuck straight in. Um, so pre uh, pre COVID, but intermediate cases were usually um, expert patients, if you like, or, or regular serial attenders. Um, and these are people that have been coming to the exam sometimes for a decade plus. And they're usually very complex or they have some interesting signs or they're just very nice people. Um, but pre-COVID, pre it was always, the, the intermediates were always, when you read the, the, the history about them from previous um, exam uh, takers, um, they're usually very complex and have 10 plus operations and most of the time actually the candidates rarely got to the diagnosis of what was happening with these patients they were so complex there's a large proportion of things like you know hip fusions having failed arthroplasty you know that kind of um, that kind of uh, 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 case but post-covid the intermediate cases tend to lend themselves to similar kind of like nuanced detail in the history taking something where you can extract a lot of information from the examiner who pretends to be the patient as you take a history it can be a little bit contrived um, but it, it is generally pretty good um, and there's usually something about some diagnostic dilemma in the clinical examination where you have to be very precise about what clinical exam you're going to do and why you're going to do it and and and, and have an explain a rationale for what picture you're building for, uh, in that intermediate case. And then there's usually got to be um, a case where there's a clear path to investigation. And um, there's got to be a clear, this, these are the steps I'm going to do to confirm what I think is happening here with the patient. Um, and then as always with the intermediates, that there is always um, a variety of treatment options available and, and there is no right or wrong answer. You've just got to be able to get across your, um, your, uh, ideas about what treatment you think the patient would uh, would be a candidate for and why and, and make it very clear that it's really the patient's decision and emergencies or acute infections uh, they're not usually like a major trauma acute scenario okay uh, it's very much um, a controlled setting where there's time to have a 15 minute discussion with a patient so uh, so there tend to be those kind of cases um, so you may get something like this, you know, a, a, a cuff arthropathy. So the stem may be something very, very simple. They usually just give you like a sentence or sometimes in the past, they'd give you like a laminate piece of paper, which just has a very bare bones GP referral letter in it. But it'll say something like, you know, a 72 year old man is referred by his GP to you for his uh, right shoulder pain and stiffness. So the good thing about shoulder cases is, is A, they're not that common in the FRCS. And when they do come up, they're usually very straightforward. And in the long cases, they tend to be a, a variation of a theme to do with cuff tear or, or, or arthroplasty usually. Um, and so when you get, when you see something like this, what you should be thinking in your mind is, okay, they're 72. So they're either, they're either gonna have cuff tear 
or arthropathy, but they're already told me that they've got pain and stiffness. So I'm now thinking it's more arthropathy than it would be cuff tear. It could still be cuff arthropathy. It could still be primary OA. It could be lots of things, but you should be um, thinking in your mind what this scenario could be just from the stem. Um, and, and so in the history, there's lots of things you can, you can pick out. And there is no right or wrong, but you've just got to build a picture in your mind about, about this patient and what they've come to talk to you about. In orthopedics, a lot of it is about pain and function, okay? And whenever you've got any pathology which is pain predominant as the presenting complaint, such as this, then you've really got to go to town on eliciting all the features of the pain, the chronicity of the pain, how long it's been going for, where do the patient feel it, what's the severity, do they have night pain? Always, always ask about night pain, no matter what um, the presentation may be, because that tells you something about uh, the patient's symptoms potentially and the pathology. So night pain is classically associated with an arthropathic um, or osteoarthritic joint. Um, with regards to activities of daily living, you need to specifically ask, is this pain inhibited? Um, what is the nature of the pain? And, and in the history, in particular for the shoulder, there's a large uh, cross uh, contamination with the cervical spine. So I always include in my history taking in real life, not just in the FRCS, when I'm asking about shoulder pain, I ask, does it radiate beyond the elbow? If it does, that's a big red flag. That this is probably not an isolated pathology of the shoulder. If it radiates beyond the elbow, it rarely is purely from the shoulder. And then if they say yes to that, my next question is always, do you get numbness, paresthesia, tingling or something like that in the fingers? If they say yes, I ask them which fingers and they often say oh, all the fingers, I don't know. And then, then you kind of move on to the next bit. Um, so that's really important. A lot of patients with shoulder pain and cuff arthropathy or cuff tears, they'll radiate their pain to the um, base of their neck and even to the occiput and they often get headaches. And that's usually thought to do with um, the trapezius being overactive and these patients trying to compensate. Um, and, and the trapezius obviously attached to the occiput. And so there's a feeling that that radiation is related to that. Um, then you can ask about movement. And, and actually movement is, is a, a bit of a difficult one to ask. You know, you can say, don't ask questions like, do you find your external rotations limited? Because th that's clearly not a question that's going to yield you some positive answers. But you could ask things like, do you find that there are things that you'd like to reach with your, with your hand that you just can't do because of your shoulder? And if they say, oh, yes, I can't stack the top shelf in the kitchen, you ask them, is that because it, you just can't get up there or it's, you feel like it's too stiff or that it's too painful to try and reach the top shelf? So, so always try and follow up and try and, build a picture of what's actually happening, uh, what the limitation is. And, and often patients may be able to reach, but they'll say, I just don't have any strength, so I can't hold anything up there for a long period of time, especially people that are still working in manual jobs, they'll say that. Um, or, or you can even ask, you know, do, do you find you get very tired and very fatigued when you try and do a lot of stuff overhead and you just, after a while, you just can't do it. And that's again, a sign of someone potentially who's compensating for not having a rotator cuff, but doesn't necessarily have a stiff joint. Um, and um, and, and it's, it's really compensating with the periscapular muscles to get the overhead activities. And then when it comes to any intermediate case, you, you then after you've got a pretty clear idea of why they're there and, and what their symptom profile is, you need to then start asking about um, past medical history and all the other stuff. And the way that I used to think of it in my mind was um, often the scenario is they're coming to you for some sort of treatment and that treatment lies on a spectrum from conservative to surgical. But in your history, you've got to um, find reasons not to and find reasons to do those treatments or offer those treatments to the patients. So for the conservative management, there are very few contraindications, right? Maybe some allergies, maybe, you know, some beliefs about them. But when it comes to surgery, there are lots of possible contraindications. So if someone is coming to you with um, severe pain, night pain, clearly arthritic shoulder, uh, but they've got like 
you know, end stage unstable angina. It's almost irrelevant that how severe their pain is in terms of the treatment options because there's no way you can ever ever offer them a major general anesthetic uh, style operation in terms of a reverse shoulder replacement. And so you've got to elicit that from the history. So my past medical history is very focused with something like this. It's usually about um, inflammatory arthropathy. It's usually about some sort of trauma or infection or previous operations because they're going to be the things that make it potentially more difficult. And then I'll, I'll ask about um, smoking, steroid use, diabetics, because that, again, I'm thinking down the line, if I'm going to be talking about arthroplasty, I'm going to be talking about why they may fail or where, why they may be difficult, et cetera. Um, so then you move on to your examination and it's usually around five minutes. Um, but always start, you know, your look, feel, move special test is, is you know, your gold standard and you should be your go-to in your mind. Um, it's a little bit different now with COVID because you just have to talk through your examination. But that doesn't mean you can't talk through it in a systematic way. So when it comes to your inspection, look at wasting in particular from the back. You know, uh, shoulder surgeons in particular love it when candidates examine the shoulder from the back because it means that they know that what they're looking for and what, that they've done it before. Look for scars, usually delta pectoral or supralateral McKenzie scars. Um, look for arthroscopy scars. You know, you're going to be saying these things. Um, and then palpation is, I think it's overstated for the shoulder because the shoulder is a deep joint. You can't really accurately palpate the glenohumeral joint that well with any meaningful positive signs. But what you can palpate is the AC joint, which can be a concomitant pathology in virtually anyone with, with uh, shoulder pain. Uh, you can um, palpate the great tuberosity in the bicipital groove, for example, but there won't be top of your list of things to say. I, I would just focus on your inspection and then an assessment of your range of motion next. So range of motion for me is, uh, you can describe it in lots of different ways, but forward flexion and abduction, um, I, I tend to do first. Internal external rotation. And external rotation is very important for something like this because when they get stiff, they lose that. Uh, but internal rotation, very rarely will, will a patient miss internal rotation. Um, as long as you can uh, uh, wipe your, your bottom when you go to the toilet, um, that's about as much internal rotation as you, as you really need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, unless you're doing some sort of other high demand functional activities. Uh, and then you need to talk about passive gain. So you ask the patient to do it actively, and then you, you're going to take over and, and see if you can um, increase the range of motion by doing it for the patient, i.e. passively. Um, and that's important because that differentiates whether the patient lacks the muscles to initiate the movement versus whether the patient also has a very stiff capsule and a very stiff glenohumeral joint from arthritis or from other pathology. And therefore the movement that they've got is, is, is limited predominantly by the bony architecture or the soft tissue constraints rather than um, a lack of a motor. Um, and then your special tests. So your external rotation lag is very important because a lot of your functional activities are in external rotation. And if you're unable to get there because you don't have an infraspinatus, um, then that's very important. And some surgeons believe that you should consider a correct, correcting that with a, with a tendon transfer at the same time of an arthroplasty, but then you're really getting onto gold medal marks. You always, always need to assess the axillary nerve when you're examining someone's shoulder because uh, most of um, the treatments conservative and surgical rely upon a functioning axillary nerve. Um, whether the long head of biceps is present or not, again, you, you can put that in if you wish, but I wouldn't say it's that high yield. And then some tests for ACJ again, if you wish. Um, I think assessing the cuffs is very important and having a good way to do this is, is really quite key. Um, so I ask the patient to put their arms forward and I put their hands, hands in a position. So you're going to have to find a way of describing that to an examiner over a, over a table in a, in a COVID style exam. Uh, but for me, what you're basically trying to say is you want the position of the arm to be slightly forward flex, slightly abducted in maximum pronation and in the scapular plane. Um, and then you're going to ask the patient to abduct and forward flex against your resistance. And you're basically going to test for weakness and compare with the other side. That will test your posterior superior cuff or mainly your superior cuff. Your anterior cuff, your subscapularis, can be tested by a belly press test or a bear hug test. 
And no one really in the shoulder world anymore really does the Gerber liftoff test because it's quite easy to cheat, number one, by extending your elbow rather than true internal rotation. And number two, if you're really arthritic, you can't get your hand in the position over your lumbar sacral joint to be able to push off. And so more reliably, uh, people will be doing the bear hug and the belly press test. Uh, and the belly press test is very simple. You ask the patient to lay the palms of their hand flat on their belly and push their elbows forward and then resist you pushing their elbows backwards. And that really tests the um, middle and lower thirds of the subscapularis in particular. And the bear hug test, I basically hold my uh, hand on touching the patient's palm and I ask them to pin my hand onto the, um, their shoulder, so onto the opposite shoulder. And I'm gonna try and resist by pushing the, the, uh, their hand away from their shoulder. And that really uh, is quite sensitive for, for the upper border of subscapularis tears, because that tends to be where they start. They start at the upper border and they peel down if they're gone. And that's again, very important uh, in some considerations for cough arthropathy. It's important in terms of setting your goals for your range of motion and what you may or may not be able to do. It's also important for stability reasons. Um, some people always repair subscap when they're doing a reverse shoulder replacement, some people never, but actually um, there is some slight nuances to that. So you've got to pick that up um, to be able to talk about it later. If you're going to test for the biceps, you should probably do more than one test because none of them are particularly good. Pick whichever ones you like, but pick more than one. The, the most sensitive one actually is probably bicepital groove tenderness, um, but none of them are particularly good. And the biceps is incredibly difficult to accurately clinically um, identify problems with. There's a, a high sensitivity and a low specificity with most tests in combination. Um, but don't get too worried about that. Just pick one or two. Um, ACJ tenderness, again, is quite a sensitive test for ACJ pain. Um, and then passive external rotation and zero degrees abduction, you need to talk about that as, as, as an important um, uh, sign and test because um, that's very important. Like I said, most of the functional movements that occur in the shoulder that people really miss in the ADLs is, is out in external rotation. Um, then you're gonna talk about investigation. So as a bare minimum, you should be talking about an AP and an axial. You can talk about it and everyone gets a radiograph, right? For shoulder pain, everyone you know just just get into the habit of always requesting x-rays for people with shoulder pain in the exam because every now and again they'll throw in something really weird like a pathological lesion or you know my united fracture or something and they'll just throw you off and so you should always get an x-ray even if it sounds purely like a rotator cuff tear just get an x-ray um ap and axial um, and then in this case you may wish to get an mri to confirm integrity but i put that in brackets because if you've got an extra, if they show you an x-ray and there's clearly not going to be a rotator cuff, right? If the humeral head is sitting underneath the acromion, there's, you know, grade four changes and superior migration. There's very little to be gained by doing an MRI. And that's the subtle things that you may wish to bring out in the exam. Uh, or you may just wish to get an MRI in everyone. But, you know, the, the candidates that score highly will be able to say, this x-ray shows significant superior migration, acetabularization of the acromion, and therefore this is end-stage cuff arthropathy. I would not get an MRI because it's unlikely to change my management in this case, but I would get a CT because there's a, a high chance of glenoid bone loss here. So with cuff arthropathy, you can lose bone at the back of the glenoid or at the superior part of the glenoid. Um, and the glenoid itself may be retroverted, that may be a dyspastic glenoid from, from birth, it may be a developmental thing, or it may be a part of their pathology. It's a bit like in the hip, when you get someone with a protrusio, you know, that, that can be quite severe. And so you may wish to look at that and comment on that. So it's the same with the shoulder. You don't tend to get protrusio, but you do get medialization and you do get retroversion. Uh, and then investigations, if in your clinical exam, you are unsure about the functioning deltoid and the auxiliary nerve signs, if there's any deficit at all in the history or the exam in the previous sections, then get nerve conduction studies. So it's a bit, a bit like a Trendelenburg patient, or if you're not sure, you test the abductors, just get nerve conduction studies. So you may, they may show you an x-ray like this and ask you to comment. So you go through your standard sequence, but just say everything that you see, right? So there's, there's clearly, this does not look like a normal shoulder. Right, the um, there's a lot of uh, bone loss. The, the glenoid looks very weird. There are at least two large cysts there, 
And always have a look at the coracoid. I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, I don't think you can. But the coracoid is, is, is overhanging there. But the glenoid fossa looks like it's at the base of the coracoid, so it's very medialized. And then you can also comment on other things like there's some cysts in the head. Um, they look a little bit osteopenic. There's AC joint arthropathy changes. And this is an attempt at an axial view, it doesn't really add very much. But if you look at the edge of the acromion, the humeral head is inside of that, right? And the humeral head is very well lateral to the edge of the acromion. Uh, and so if it's inside of that, it means that there's potentially massive amounts of medialization here. Um, you can't assess all of that on the radiographs. And like we said, you'll get a CT. And then the CT tells you a completely different picture. So you, you barely can't even tell the, where the glenoid fossa is here. It's so retroverted. This is about 60, 70 degrees of retroversion. Um, and if you look on the left-hand view of the axial images, if you draw a line along the spine of the scapula exiting in the glenoid fossa, that's called the Friedman's line. And that's thought to be the anatomical axis of the scapular body. And your glenoid vault is meant to be perpendicular to that or within five to 10 degrees uh, of, or 90 degrees of that. But you can see in this case, it's like 60 degrees. And so the, the whole humeral head is sublux posterior to Friedman's line. And that's referred to as posterior subluxation. It can be quantified as a percentage, um, but that is usually goes hand in hand with massive retroversion. And on the uh, coronal, um, uh, sequences, you can see there's a large cyst. You can just comment on these things, just say, um, just say this is a complex half of plastic case. Um, there's massive amounts of retroversion, medialization, bone loss with some cysts. Uh, this is going to be a challenge for a number of reasons. And you can talk about preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. So, preoperative, um, the, the challenges are going to be about planning, uh, getting the right kit, what operation are you going to do. Intraoperative is going to be um, exposure, soft tissue related, bone new related, implant related challenges. And then post operative is going to be um, how do you rehabilitate with someone like, where you reconstruct such a severe deformity? Um, and things like bleeding and HDU beds, that all falls into that, that category. So always try and classify it. Um, so the treatment always start with physiotherapy, lifestyle modification. You could consider injection for patients that you think. Um, are leaning more towards avoiding an operation, but just be aware that there's some studies from big registries in the US, um, you know, medical insurance registries that show if you do an injection within three months, it increases your risk of infection when you go to do an arthroplasty. And if you want some extra marks, instead of just saying physiotherapy, just say an anterior deltoid rehab program. And that's really uh, very useful to help co uh, patients compensate by retraining their deltoid to get them their forward flexion and, that, and uh, abduction. You could consider suprascapular nerve blocks. You're not too worried about a suprascapular nerve because it's supplying the cuff, which is no longer there. It's completely non-functional in this case. So you can do a block with the steroid and local. You can do it blind. You can do it ultrasound guided. You can do it um, in lots of different ways. Pain clinic can do it. Um, but that can be a good temporizing measure for patients that don't want surgery. But really, the way that this case is going to take you, you're going to go towards the discussion about reverse shoulder replacement. And, and the, the level of knowledge required is actually very limited, okay? It's not like in the hip where you'll need to know every possible option of how you reconstruct the loose hip replacement and what you're going to do and what the options are and what the implants can achieve and can't achieve and the classifications of bone loss and all that stuff. In, in this kind of case for the shoulder, the, the standard required of knowledge is actually not that high. So they'll ask you maybe what are the prerequisites for doing a reverse? So your axillary nerve is going to be functioning, otherwise your deltoid won't work and your shoulder replacement won't work. You've got to have a glenoid vault that can accommodate an implant, right? Um, and you're going to have no infection. Um, and then they may ask, you know, what is a reverse shoulder replacement? And you'll say, well, there's a reverse polarity. You, you, there's a glenosphere and a humeral tray. And it's more conforming than an anatomic because there's no mismatch between the radius of curvature of the glenosphere and the radius of curvature of the humeral tray, unlike the case with the native shoulder or the anatomic where there is a mismatch. Um, it, it's a design that medializes the center of rotation, and therefore optimizes the deltoid lever arm. Um, and if there's glenoid bone loss, then um, that is one of the indications for a reverse, even if the rotator cuff is intact. And that's been shown by a gentleman who's recently retired from Leon called Jim Walsh, who's like a godfather of shoulder arthroplasty. 
and um, he basically demonstrated in severe retroverted glenoids um, if you do an anatomic there's a higher rate of failure than if you just did a uh, reverse and then if you're really doing well they may ask you well how are you going to build up that bone loss you can either do it with bone or you can do it with metal um, and the jury's out there's no right or wrong answer about that but oh, that's all you got to say and then, and then you'll be well on to uh, getting a seven or an eight and so in case you're interested this is what we did for that chap and you can you can just about see there's a there's a very large humeral head graft, a 50 millimeter graft, and an extra long peg and screws that will uh, compress that graft onto the native glenoid, um, which is what we did for him, and he's doing well. Um, next case um, is let's say a young person, and it's kind of going to be AVN or maybe instability arthropathy, something like that, but they'll throw in an arthroplasty in a younger person because there's lots to talk about. So they might say to you, you know, 52 year old builder referred by his GP, again, same thing, shoulder pain and stiffness. So the history is gonna be the same as before, but you may wish to consider because of their age, what the pathology is gonna be. So you may ask a bit more about steroid use, smoking, previous radiotherapy, all the things that can cause AVN, HIV, sickle cell. You may throw those in there. Uh, asking questions about the occupation and the level of sport is very important because you may have someone with end stage arthropathy but they want to play tennis or they want to play cricket. We had one the other day, he wants to play cricket, he's a fast bowler. And so you've really got to be careful as to um, uh, adapting your treatment options to fit what the patient is going to require from that shoulder, because very few people are going to be bowling at pace with um, a shoulder replacement inside you. Okay. Um, and in this case, these patients, especially if they had instability, for example, they may have had multiple operations in the past, uh, multiple traumas and you need to bring that out in the history the examination again same as before be systematic but you may wish to throw in a bit more about crepitus on palpation uh, checking the auxiliary nerve looking for the scars assessing a range of motion is very important because the range of motion preoperatively predicts range of motion postoperatively in the shoulder generally speaking and then this is where you really got to hammer your cuff integrity ex examination because um, that's going to be key for what you're going to offer this patient Again, investigations are roughly very similar, nothing new there. Um, and then when it comes to treatment, you've just got to just say, be very clear from the beginning. This is a very complex case because it's a young person with bad arthritis, they may show you an x-ray with really bad arthritis. And so you just got to understand, just like you if you had a DDH patient who's in their early twenties that needs a hip replacement, you just got to say, this is a complex case. As soon as you say that, then they know, okay, this person understands that this is not just something you just add onto the list and you know crack on the next available elected list that you have. You need to think about it, plan it, put it through the MDT. Um, and, and when it comes to young people in arthroplasty, you always think about the whole life of the shoulder, not just that implant you're putting in, because you, these patients will often require multiple revisions in their lifetime. And in the shoulder, you don't have an endless supply of bone, especially on the glenoid side. So you've got to consider that. So always start conservative. Then they may ask you about uh, arthroplasty options, and then you can talk about hemi-arthroplasty versus total shoulder replacement. And that distinction really comes from um, the state of the glenoid on the MRI or the CT. How worn is it? And then if you say hemi or you suggest hemi, they may say, would you do a metal hemi or would you do something else? And they're really getting at pyrocarbon, which again, there's no strong evidence to say that it's better, but generally speaking, in this case, these, these cases are quite rare. Um, if there's a small chance that pyrocarbon may help avoid glenoid erosion, then most surgeons will, will opt to use that um, for that reason. And all you've got to say is just that. Just say, I'd be a bit worried that if you do a hemi, um, the next operation may be challenging because the hemi may erode the glenoid, native glenoid bone. So therefore, I may consider a pyrocarbon implant, even though it's only really backed by observational data, not any strong evidence. Um, and then if you do really well, they may ask you about, do you know the difference between a stemless, a short stem and a resurfacing? Um, and essentially, the stemless, you're making a, a cut, but there's just a corral that's going into the metaphysis. There's no stem attached to it which is different to resurfacing where you're basically just dusting off and removing the cartilage from the humeral head and putting a cap on versus a short stem, which is as it, as, as it sounds, a short stem that's usually porous coated around the, the metaphysis and it's metaphyseal bearing only. But you've got to say MDT and you've got to say specialist referral. But if you are going to say those things, don't end with those things. So if you get a complex case, do say 
I will, uh, if I, if this came to my clinic and I'm a day one DGH surgeon, I will be referring this to a specialist tertiary center that has expertise and um, personnel that has experience with dealing with these young people that require arthroplasty. However, assuming I am that specialist, the principles of treatment are as follows. So never end with, I'd refer it on, because the next question is always going to be, okay, you're the person they refer it on to, what are you going to do? Because that's where the, the marks are. And the marks come from there because it, it's, it's how you verbalize your thought process that gets you to that seven and eight, all right? So they may show you an x-ray like this. This is not an AVM case. This is an instability arthropathy patient. Um, he's 50, he is 52. Uh, and he's got quite, you know, quite a bad glenoid and quite a bad humerus with lots of osteophytes and he's quite stiff. But he's not got a lot of retroversion. He's not got a lot of bone loss. Um, and so he had a short stem total shoulder replacement. Um, if you're wondering, this is what these look like. So there's a pyrocarbon um, hemi on the top left. There are some, and there's an x-ray of um, uh, resurfacing on the bottom left. And then in the middle and on the right, these are stemless um, hemiarthroplasties. The bottom right, D, is actually a stemless total shoulder replacement. You can see the little radiographic marker in the glenoid. Um, it's very subtle. Uh, same with the top right, actually. There's a, you can't make it out that clearly, but there's a keeled glenoid component in there. And so when, you, when you're looking at the shoulder um, with a shoulder replacement inside you, it's often hard to see the glenoid component because it's usually all poly. But there's usually a radiographic marker in there somewhere, so just look carefully. Um, so you may get a massive cuff tear patient. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but it, they may say something like right shoulder pain and weakness. You see that's different to stiffness, it's weakness. And if they're going to throw that out there, they may not throw the word weakness out, but they may say, oh, she's struggling to carry her shopping or something along those lines. Um, it's something to do with weakness. Always think massive cuff tear. Um, I'm going to move on from that, but essentially you want to determine whether it's a acute or chronic degenerative or uh, traumatic and or whether the patient's pseudo paralytic or not. Um, in terms of treatments for massive cuff tears, it's usually determined by the age of the patient, what they want to do with their shoulder, whether they've got any arthritis um, and uh, whether they've got any comorbidities. So in young people that are functionally high demand without arthritis, you may attempt a partial repair where you repair maybe some of infraspinatus and as much of supraspinatus as you can, but not try and uh, over tighten the, the cuff to try and get it back to the footprint if it's not going to reach. Or you may consider tendon transfers. You very rarely would do that in this country. It's not really the common practice, but you may wish to just drop it in and just say, you know, in, in some parts of the world, tendon transfers are indicated in this group, but I don't have any experience with this. I'll refer it on to a specialist with some interest in this area. Or you may do something called a superior capsular reconstruction, which um, essentially you're putting a, an, an allograft, usually a dermal allograft, connecting it to the glenoid, connected to the humeral head. And it acts like a reverse trampoline to uh, stop the superior migration of the humeral head. Again, quite popular five to 10 years ago, but uh, hasn't been evaluated in a level one study as yet. If they're an older patient with a little bit of arthritis, it's very simple, you do a reverse, okay? Even if there isn't that much arthritis because um, you're trying to overcome the lack of a rotator cuff and a reverse implant is designed to do that, right? It's designed to function without a rotator cuff, um, but you'd never really like to do it when there's no arthritis, especially in younger people. So be wary of suggesting that unless they're a bit older, over the age of 70, um, and at least with some evidence of arthritis. They don't have to have a lot, but if you have some, then it's a little bit more justifiable. And never forget to say, refer to the MBT or special center because you know these cases can be quite difficult to, to manage. You know, they're very difficult. And you may, they may show you a scan like this and you can see the head's ridden up, it, the humeral head's almost touching the acromion. There's lots of white, you know, um, contrast and fluid there. And there isn't any sign of any supraspinatus. There may be some supraspinatus medial to the glenoid fossa there, but not much, okay? If they show you like that, something like this, this is not reconstructable in the vast majority of cases. Um, they may ask you, if you get massive cuff tear, they may ask you about how you assess the quality of the rotator cuff. Uh, the top right is something called a tangent sign, which is drawing a line across the highest points of the supraspinatus fossa, bony arch. 
And um, if the muscle lies below that, that's tangent sign positive. You can also grade the degree of fatty infiltration within the muscle on the parasagittal view, uh, where you see that Y view of the scapular spine and the scapular body. Uh, on that view, on a CT scan, you can classify it by the Gutelier stage, which is zero to five, or more commonly in this country, or based on an MRI scan, you can uh, classify it by the Fuchs, uh, Fuchs uh, stage, which is one, two, and three, which is, um, is there more muscle than fat? Is there some fat? Is there more fat than muscle, basically? Um, I'm not going to talk about this case, but um, I'm going to give uh, Sean my slides as well, but I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to move on from that. Uh, I'm just going to say one thing, actually, about that. Um, so sometimes they may ask you, um, if you could do really well, they may ask you about implants for shoulder replacement, and you just need to be aware of this concept, which is a platform-based uh, shoulder replacement. So what a platform-based shoulder replacement basically means is you have a humeral stem that can, and a glenoid base plate that can both take interchangeably a humeral tray or a humeral head and a glenoid uh, poly insert or a glenosphere. Uh, and that's all, all these are designed for is basically when you have a patient who had arthritis with an intact rotator cuff, you can do an anatomic shoulder replacement if the cuff then fails, which it can do later in life, because there's a high rate of rotator cuff tears as we get older anyway, if it then fails for whatever reason, instead of taking out all the implants, you can just take off the head from the uh, humeral stem and put a humeral tray. You can take off the poly from the, um, from the glenoid base plate and just put a glenosphere on. And that's called a component exchange where you're reversing the polarity without having to remove all of the implants. And that's all a platform-based system allows you to do. So moving on to uh, short cases. Um, these are pre-COVID, these are essentially spotted. If you read the exam experiences of people, um, essentially these were patients that were brought really as a, as, a, as a cue, as an aid to allowing you to show the examiner what the clinical sign is that they have or how you would assess that and bring it out. It, it was never, if you read people's experiences of the short cases in the exam pre-COVID, it was never do a shoulder exam starting, you know, with the hands and inspection, you know, doing your whole look, feel, and move special test from start to finish. It was never that. It was always show me how you test for subscap tears and it'll be, this is how I get the patient to do a bear hug test or a belly press test or whatever. Um, so it's always about demonstration pathology. But post COVID, there's lots of photos, there's some videos of um, clinical signs, and then you're expected to um, explain what the clinical sign is and why is it like that? What is the test for this? And what is the principle that underpins that clinical test? Um, and it's really an opportunity for you to show that you understand why we test for certain things in certain ways and what a positive test is and what that means for the patient. So it's very focused on very simple things. So a classic one in the FRCS is scapular winging. You get shown a picture because they're easy to get hold of. And then you, you ask, what is this? And you can't just say scapular winging because you know where this is going to go. So you're going to say you know, there's an abnormal posture of the scapula with a prominent medial border and a prominent inframedial angle of the scapula. This is likely to represent weakness of, and then you've got to determine whether it's this, which, which is a weakness of serratus anterior, which may be related to a long thoracic nerve palsy, or it may be this, which is weakness of trapezius related to a spinal accessory nerve problem. Now you can see the difference between the two, um, the key is to look at the inframedial angle of the, um, of the uh, scapula. If it's closer to the midline, but the whole scapular border is, is winged out, this is true winging, this is from serratus anterior uh, or deficit. If the whole uh, scapula looks like it's gone lateral and the inframedial angle of the scapula has gone lateral around the chest wall, then it's likely to do with a trapezius problem. Okay, and, and, and usually the questions are very, that's all, that's all that you, you're asked is, what are the muscles that are weak and what nerve supplies them? And then usually what's the treatment? Um, you just need to know a little bit about that. So you just need to know your shoulder girdle anatomy, you need to know your nerve supply, 
uh, you need to be able to elicit the differences between traumatic and atraumatic and pain versus painless, okay? And that's really important because sometimes patients present with winging um, and they have a short period of burning pain, which then disappears after a week or two. And that's usually a Parsonage Turner syndrome, some sort of um, uh, neuritis essentially. Uh, and, and then you need to determine whether it's expectant management versus intervening by referring to the peripheral nerve injury unit and, and getting nerve conduction studies and things like that. Um, usually you don't do anything in the first three to four weeks and observe, see if it gets better. Uh, but if there's any red flags or if there's any signs of trauma, then consider investigating and referring it on. But there are only five minutes, these short cases, so there isn't much to talk about. Um, and there's a bonus point if you're really interested. I'm not sure if these are going to play. Uh, and that's not playing great. But um, this guy's got some winging as he's going up and down. You can see his scapula is moving very abnormally. But... Um, he doesn't actually have winging because when you get him to do a, um, a, a press up against the wall, his scapula doesn't wing at all. So this is actually, you know, when is winging not winging? It's when there's a very weak rotator cuff. So the serrated anterior and trapezius are all working just fine, uh, but his cuff is very weak. And so it doesn't allow him to centralize his um, clenohumeral joints. So his scapula starts to do funny things. And you do see this sometimes, uh, sometimes even in patients that have had uh, dislocations. Um, another short case, classic one is a pseudopalliative shoulder. So you may show in a picture like this and you're told this, this gentleman is being asked to elevate as maximum as possible. And you're meant to say, well, the right demonstrates a pseudopalliative shoulder. And you may get asked the question, what is the definition of pseudoparalysis? And um, some people's definition is uh, inability to abduct and forward flex beyond 90 degrees. The true definition is unable to keep the arm um, abducted and forward flexed when it's passively placed above 90 degrees. Uh, and there's a subtle difference between the two. Um, but essentially, if you just say that this is, um, I'm concerned this is a massive rotator cuff tear, um, it, but I'm going to try and differentiate between a neurological problem and an arthritic problem, uh, that that would be sufficient. So you need to know about whether this is traumatic or atraumatic, where, what the previous function was like, what the function of the bands of the patient are, is, what's the degree of arthritis, and you need to have some idea of a differential. So if you think of it very simply, if you can't lift your arm up, you can't lift your arm up because you, your nerves are not working to the muscles that do that motion, or your tendon is just not attached, so your rotator cuff is totally not attached, so therefore your deltoid cannot provide the function if your humeral head is no longer centered on your uh, glenoid fossa, or if you're very, very arthritic, from uh, whatever pathology, arthritis or cough arthropathy, then um, you just won't be able to get up there because you're so stiff. Um, and if it is a cough tear type picture, then age and degree of arthritis is very important, okay? Um, and a young pseudopalliative shoulder is very difficult to treat. Whilst an elderly one is reasonably straightforward, especially if they've got arthritis, because they can easily be reversed with a, a reverse, assuming their deltoid is functioning. So you may get uh, you may get something like this, a picture of this, and you get told, "Oh, this person, you know, sustained a rugby injury six months ago. What's he going to do?" And you, you you can you can tell where this station is going to go. You got five minutes. You're going to say what the diagnosis is, which is ACJ separation. They may show you this as a cue. Then the next question is about the anatomy. Usually, what structures are injured? Conoid, trapezoid, AC ligament. Then there's a question about classification. They may not ask you about classification, but they may say, how do you differentiate between a, a bad injury and a not so bad injury? And all you really got to say is about displacement. Um, and the, the candidates that score the highest understand that this is not about how high your clavicle is or how low the rest of your arm is in relation to it. It's all about um, stability of your scapula, especially in forward flexion um movements so what tends to happen when you have a disruption of your ac joint is when you um forward flex your your arm your scapula tilts forward and you get pain and it no longer is stable um, and so what tends to happen is the clavicle actually goes posteriorly so always get an axial view of these patients and you'll see that the clavicle is sitting posterior to the acromion and, and that's just a, a position that's it can be painful and debilitating in very severe amounts of displacement. But mild amounts of displacement can be well tolerated. Um, 
So people often say one of the I think one of the bugbears that I have about um, FRCS uh, tips is you don't need to know their classifications. Well, yes, that is true, but um, if you do know them, it's a means of demonstrating some knowledge about an understanding of severity and classification of an injury. And it gives you something to talk about. And if it's an easy one to remember, then um, then why not try and learn it? So um, I'll briefly talk you through this classification, which is the Rockwood classification. Um, type 1 is essentially a sprain. Type 2 is a disruption of the AC ligament, but not of the conoid and trapezoid. Uh, type 3 is a disruption of the AC ligament and the trapezoid, but sometimes the conoid's intact and therefore you don't get a lot of displacement. Type four is when the clavicle goes so posterior, it actually pierces the clavipectoral fascia and the trapezial fascia at the back. Um, type five is the one that we like to catch and operate on because they're very unstable. And essentially it's to do with amount of displacement compared to the opposite side. Um, so more than a hundred percent. And then type six, you can almost ignore because it's only ever really been reported once in the literature and it doesn't really, um, it's not very common at all, but it's where it sits underneath the um, coracoid. Uh, so then you get asked about treatment options and because it's chronic, um, people get very, um, have very strong views on, on this. Some people um, would advocate you can't do something like this because there's a high rate of failure. Because it's a chronic situation, uh, because the conoid and trapezoid ligaments tend to evolve from the underside of the clavicle as a subperiosteal avulsion, um, they don't heal very often if you just reduce the dislocation, stabilize the shoulder, because the healing capacity of those scarred ligaments six months later is very low. So a lot of people advocate doing uh, a synthetic ligament like this. This is called a lockdown. It's a polyester ligament that you wrap around the coracoid, you wrap around the clavicle, and you hold it in place with a screw. Uh, if you do this, you should always excise the distal end of the clavicle or a hook plate in the acute case, but not in the chronics. Because again, this relies on the same principle. The hook plate is essentially reducing your dislocation to allow your native ligaments to heal on the underside of the clavicle. Uh, and if it's a chronic case, this is going to fail because uh, there is little healing potential to occur six months later. If it's an acute case, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but you have to remember to remove the hook plate uh, later because um, uh, it can cause damage, especially in abduction over 90 degrees. Now I'm going to move on from this. You may get, you get shown a Popeye sign. Just think rotator cuff tear, especially in the middle aged to older person. Um, okay, quickly on to vivas. Um, again, these tend to be lend themselves to photos, images, videos, and you just need to be aware there's multiple avenues. People often get caught out because they know a friend who got the same question, uh, but they got asked totally different. You know, they got the same image, but they got asked totally different questions, and that can happen. I think on average, every station that's written has three avenues which they can go down, and the examiners can just choose which one they, they want before you come in to sit down. Um, so just focus on the pertinent features of your decision making, the principles of the treatment and the basic science that underpins the, the pathology and you'll be fine. So if you get some showing something like this, this is clearly an anterior dislocation. You can see the uh, squaring off of the uh, left shoulder. You can see that the acromion is very visible compared to the deltoid muscle bulk and the great tuberosity, uh, which is sitting anterior and medial now. Um, and the pertinent features are how old is this person? What was the mechanism? Was it, were they just getting out of bed or did they have a significant en energy tackle playing rugby? How many times has it come out? Is there any neurology both around the plexus but also the auxiliary nerve? Um, is there any, once it's reduced, is there any anterior apprehension? Uh, what do they do for a job and do they do any contact sports? Okay. And the next question is always gonna be about how you classify it, what are the different types of instability? And you just need to be aware of this concept, which is the Stanmore triangle, where there are three polar types, but a patient can sit anywhere within that triangle and be a combination of all three. And they can also vary with time. But essentially type one is the ones that you'll most often see in the fracture clinic, young person, traumatic event, anterior dislocation, and there'll be a type one. Type two tends to be a, a hypermobile patient with minimal trauma, and, a, and they may also have an injury. Um, which may be addressed following extensive course of physiotherapy. And then type three are the ones that uh, you'll get called to see in A&E. They're usually teenagers 
are usually uh, well known to the a &E registrars and consultants. They come in every week for the midazolam and propofol. Um, and they basically are patterning and they're, they're, they're driving their shoulder out by contracting their pectoralis major or their latissimus dorsi so significantly that it's pulling the whole shoulder out joint. Uh, so you operate on type ones, you rarely operate on type two, so you never operate on type threes. And then you need to be aware of the best guidelines and be aware of um, uh, Robinson's paper, which essentially were built on the work from the Hevelius in Sweden, which demonstrated that age and gender were significant predictors of recurrence and age being the number one thing. So if you're, um, if you're 25 and a, and a bloke, uh, regardless of what kind of sport you engage in, you've got over 50% uh, risk of recurrence within two years and your lifetime risk is even higher than that. And so just be aware that the younger you are, the more likely you are to be aggressive with offering uh, surgical management in type one instability. And especially if you're a, a male who does contact sports. You may get shown an x-ray like this and asked to comment and just say, you know, this is an N located shoulder with a significant hill sax defect, which you can see there on the greater uh, trochanter. It's essentially a divot. It's a bit like if you hit a coat can on the side of the edge of a table, it'll make an indentation. That's basically what's happened here. And they may ask you, where is the hill sax in terms of relation to the humeral head? And in an anterior dislocation, it tends to be um, uh, medial and posterior. Okay, so right over where the infraspinatus tendon would, uh, would cross. Um, if you do see something like that, they may ask you about bone loss and hill sack lesions, and, and they're basically just trying to, uh, you, they're trying to elicit whether you understand that you can't just do your standard arthroscopic soft tissue stabilization in these patients. So are you a instability picture with bone loss? They may show you a CT or an X-ray. They're really just trying to elicit whether you understand that you just can't do your standard um, soft tissue procedure, or you can't do your standard rehab program because there's a higher rate of failure. And so all you've really got to say is you've got to assess the glenoid bone loss on a CT. You've got to assess the size of the hill sax lesion and consider doing a bony operation rather than a soft tissue operation. And they may ask you why, or what's that for? You say, well, the commonest procedure is a latige. And that takes the coracoid and sticks it onto the front of the glenoid to reconstitute the bone loss, but also has the benefit of incorporating the conjoint tendon as a sling over the anterior glenohumeral joint in abduction and external rotation, providing a secondary restraint to anterior dislocation. And the traditional um, technique involves also taking a one centimeter uh, part of the CA ligament, which is attached to the coracoid base and uh, stitching that to the capsule, to uh, adding a kind of an extra restraint on the anterior shoulder. I'm not gonna talk too much about massive cuff tears in the viva because we've already briefly touched on that. You may get an infected arthroplasty and just don't get too bogged down with this, right? It's the same as any infected total knee. It'll go the same way. It'll be, it's about chronicity, it's about dare, it's about antibiotics, it's about confirming infection. It's about sampling. They may show you an x-ray with some bone loss and some loosening. You can see, you know, there's some lucency lines around the glenoid there. There's some significant amount of bone loss underneath the humeral head, both laterally and medially. So just say what you see. Don't just think of it as a knee or a hip. It's no different. Um, and you may get asked about the osteolysis cascade, you know, uh, as you would in the hip. So the treatment for this is usually, you know, aggressive debridement, uh, excision, spaces, multiple biopsies, six, at least six weeks of antibiotics, um, followed by a second stage revision. And then often in these cases, you can't do a anatomic again, you've got to do a reverse because the rotator cuff usually takes a bit of a beating with infection. I'm gonna talk about frozen shoulder. Calcium tendonitis seems to come up a lot. Just appreciate that the X-ray may be very subtle. It's usually in young women. It's usually very, very severe pain. They come to A&E, they're 10 out of 10 pain. And then they may ask you, what are you gonna do? Just give them a steroid injection. As long as their blood tests are normal, and there's no signs of infection, you give them a steroid injection and see them a week later in fracture clinic, they'll be very grateful for that. And just appreciate that the mainstay of treatment is conservative and very rarely is it surgery. 
you may get a pathological lesion like this. Doesn't look that bad, right? It looks like an enchondroma, but it's definitely not. Uh, you need to assume that this is not a benign lesion, work it up as you would any sarcoma, talk about sarcoma management principles, uh, talk about you know adverse pathological signs on radiographs and imaging, things like size, location, periosteal reaction, zone of transition, all of those things. Um, and then they may ask you what it is. And uh, proximal humerus is a common site for an enchondroma or a chondrosarcoma um, or an osteosarcoma occasionally. I got this in my exam. I'm not sure if this is going to play. Um, this is just a large lipoma. And I hammered the whole MDT sarcoma referral over and over and over and over again until they said, yeah, okay, fine. They've been through all that. They said it's benign. What are you going to do? I said, well, I'll refer it back again. And said, okay, you've done all that. What? They said it's benign. Um, what are you going to do? Like, I'm going to excise it. Um, and you can do that. And, but also always send it for histology. Um, but the things you need to uh, appreciate here is that this is large. It's um, an element of it is deep to the muscle. Um, and uh, so that's enough, really, for you to be concerned and refer it on uh, to the MDT, for the sarcoma MDT. But you can remove these, and they often are benign. Uh, but you never do that primarily. You always have to be 100% sure that the MDT is confident that this is not a malignant lesion. Uh, in your peds viva, you may get an offended proximal humerus. Spot diagnosis, just leave it alone. If they've got um, a lot of uh, bone remodeling potential left, if they're under the age of 10, for example, um, you can accept 100% 100 displacement. As long as both parts of the bone are still inside the patient, you can just leave it alone. It will totally remodel into looking like a normal humerus. You may get something like this. I got this in the EBOT exam, um, which is a fracture and a fallen leaf sign from a, a fracture through a simple bone cyst. And, um, and uh, the, the question is usually around management. So in the acute phase, you do nothing. You put them in a sling and you wait for the fracture to heal. And then in the subacute phase, they'll ask you questions about how do you deal with a persistent uh, bone cyst. What's the differential? You get a simple bone cyst or an original bone cyst or very rarely a telangiectasic uh, osteosarcoma. Um, but there are various things that you can do. You can graft them. You can put calcium uh, sulfate cement beads in. Uh, you can inject them with phenol. People have tried lots of different things, but essentially demineralized bone matrix, you put anything in it, but essentially it's some sort of grafting and and uh, the French tend to put intravenous nails in, in these, but uh, we don't tend to do very much. We tend to just leave them, and most of the time they will resolve. Proximal humerus fractures, um, common topic. Uh, how would you treat these? You know, they're not all the same. Uh, you got to appreciate the patient that they're attached to, um, and in the context. Okay, you need to know a little bit about how to like discuss them, one part, two part, three part, four part, um, head split, dislocations, these are all relevant. Uh, don't worry too much about the classification, but just be aware that there is some evidence that um, the more parts there are and the more displaced it is, uh, the higher the risk of AVM. You, you will need to know about the profit trial. Uh, so I'd recommend you read it. It's a large trial, multi-center pragmatic study comparing surgery versus non-surgery for displaced proximal humerus fractures. Um, and essentially, <clears throat> the primary outcome is the Oxford Scholes score at two years, and they found no difference between surgery and non-surgery. But it was a pragmatic study, so if a surgeon came across a patient that was screened for the study and met the eligibility criteria, but they felt that they would do very badly from one treatment or another, they, uh, they had the, um, uh, the pragmatism to be able to uh, not enroll them. And so um, be aware that that is the way the trial was set up. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. It creates a lot of external validity because that's what happens in the real world. You don't just treat everyone by an algorithm. You have some nuance to what we do. And so in the context of a dislocated head or a nerve injury or just a really bad fracture in a young person, it isn't always just do nothing and leave them alone, okay? Um, clavicle fractures you may get a lateral clavicle fracture and, and just treat this the same as the AC joint injuries um, have a look at the position of the um, 
middle part of the clavicle in relation to the coracoid and whether uh, the coroid and trapezoid ligaments are actually still attached to the main part of the, the skeleton. Because if they're not, if it's very displaced, then you treat it like an, uh, an acute ACJ. Um, it just so happens to have a fracture to it. Um, and so those two are very different, right? The first one, not very displaced. It's likely those coroid and trapezoid ligaments are partially intact and therefore the injury is stable. So you can leave the first one, but this one, you can tell that there's a massive disruption of the CC ligaments here. And so you know, this may even be threatening the skin. So you may wish to fix something like this. And how you fix it is up to you. There's lots of different ways. Lateral clavicle plate, CC ligament fixation, hook plate, all of those are in play. When it comes to mid shaft fractures, it's uh, very controversial. And just say that there's a lot of controversy on this. Um, don't talk about shortening, okay? Because it's again, very controversial. And the studies that show shortening was an important predictor have now also had studies that come out that say it's not an important predictor. So don't get too bogged down with shortening, but just mention that there are multiple randomized control trials. And the best indication for doing surgery is to try and avoid a non-union, but the numbers needed to treat are between seven and a half and 10. Um, but doing surgery does not improve the function based on functional outcome measures and the MCID, the minimal clinical important difference is usually not met if you look at these studies when you do surgery versus not surgery. But one thing is for sure, you do reduce the non-union rate for all comers from around 10 to 12 percent to around two to three percent. So that's good. You may wish to talk about predictors of non-union for mid-shaft fractures. So displacement, comminution, smoking uh, is potentially predictive. Again, this is not the strongest evidence. It's reasonable. It's not the strongest. This guy in Edinburgh has done quite a lot of work on this. Got some great papers on this. Uh, but just be aware of their limitations, right? People often quote this one, which says, you know, at six weeks, if you do a quick dash, you do an x-ray and you assess them clinically, you can predict which one's going to non-union. But you have to understand the statistics on this were done on 27 events. Okay, so 200 clavicles, but 27 non-unions. So the multiple regression model is actually very weak. Uh, it's not that strong. So don't hang all of your clinical decision-making on one study. And then finally, uh, last case is a locked posterior dislocation. You'll often get shown something like this. It looks a bit funny. There's the head, it looks like a light bulb. This is the light bulb sign. It doesn't look end located, but you can't say for sure. So just always get a second view, right? Why do we always get a second view? Because things aren't always what they seem. And you can only really tell on orthogonal x-rays. So in this context, there's another fracture, but you can see if you get an axial view or even a modified axial view or a bell pew view or a Wallace view, whatever you want to call it, just some orthogonal view shooting down onto the uh, AC joint and the glenohumeral joint, you will see that the head is sitting posterior. Uh, and so you are, you know, then you'll get a CT, which will confirm it and demonstrate the amount of uh, how chronic this may be. If you get this viva station in an elderly person scenario, always assume this has been out of, out of joint for months, all right? Especially if they say this is a nursing home resident who's got cognitive impairment. As far as you're concerned, this has been out for over a year. So the answer is not tend to theater for an MUA. The answer is get a CT, speak to a shoulder surgeon. And then they'll say, okay, what are you gonna do? Well, you, you, then you'll say, I'll get a CT. I will look for uh, arthropathy changes and chronic change on the glenoid. And then I would discuss with the patient about surgical options. And the surgical options usually are in a young person, try to stabilize it and osteotomize the lesser trochanter and advance it in a procedure called the McLaughlin procedure or the modified McLaughlin procedure. Or in the elderly person, it's to do a reverse shoulder replacement. You get mega asked, what are the radiographic signs of posterior dislocation? And everyone knows light bulb sign, but there are others. There's the loss of the half moon overlap sign, which is to do with the overlap between the, the glenoid and the humerus. There's usually a bit of an overlap. There's the trough line sign, which is basically where you get a reverse fill sac. So you get this like indentation, which is seen as an increased density stripe on the mid part of the humerus, the humeral head. And then there's the rim sign, which is basically where you get a total shoe through and a completely vacant glenohumeral joint space. 
um, which is uh, indicated by a posterior dislocation. And this for, for the gold medal winners uh, is what a mod modified McLaughlin procedure is. Um, McLaughlin himself described uh, putting, taking off the subscap and plugging that into the defect um, in 1950 of JBJS. But the modified McLaughlin is uh, taking off the lesser uh, tuberosity with the subscap and plugging that into the defect. And that essentially just fills in that gap to allow um, the head to remain stable. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. That's an excellent talk. Um, uh, pretty much every one of those topics uh, will come up in the exam in one, one form or the other. It's really good. Um, there doesn't seem to be any questions at the moment. I'm sure someone will have some questions in a moment, but I do want to ask you a couple of things, if you don't mind. I'm sure. going to put you in the spot. Um, what if you were asked about a 65-year-old uh, rotator cuff injury, maybe a few months old or a, a half a year or uh, with no arthritis? What would you do for that patient? Yeah, so I think that depends on the patient. So not all 65-year-olds are the same. So if they're still working, they're doing quite manual work or they're engaged in a reasonable amount of sport, and they're physiologically a lot younger than 65, then I would investigate with an MRI, look for fatty infiltration changes, look for arthritis. And if they've got a repairable cuff tear, I would advocate um, repairing it if they fail physiotherapy. I would not offer an injection in that case. And I would explain to them that um, a, a, a repair that heals is superior to a repair that doesn't heal, and that's superior to not having a, an attempt at a repair. And that's to do with strength, it's to do with function, but it's not necessarily to do with pain because you can manage the pain with injections and physiotherapy, but it's hard to get your strength and function back to 100% without um, a healed repair. Um, if they're physiologically quite poor, you know, they have multiple comorbidities, the sedentary lifestyle, they don't do really any overhead work, then I would talk to them about a steroid injection, maybe super scapula nerve block, um, physiotherapy and just avoid doing surgery in that age group. And then the other thing I always tell patients is um, we can reattach the tendon to the bone, but it doesn't always heal. And so the rate of being satisfied with a cuff repair is around 90 to 95%, but the rate of it remaining intact at a year on an MRI is around 70%. And so you, you have to explain to patients that it's not just about reattaching a detached tendon, it's about re-stabilizing re a shoulder that is out of sync. And one of the ways of doing that is to do the repair. So it's, it's very, um, it's a very nuanced thing. I, I don't think you, I mean, you might get that in the viva, but you, you could easily get that in the intermediate case because there's lots to talk about um, mm. in there. Exactly. And it, I, I like the way your approach was that uh, there's no black and white answer. It's a discussion with the patient, shared decision. The way you've described this is a shared decision, yeah. thing, but also, the physiological age of your patient is a factor in all of this, of course. Um, another uh, thing that I liked about your talk, uh, especially you, you reiterated the importance of MDT, complex case, um, stating that out from the beginning immediately relaxes the examiners. And I think I ca that cannot be overstated. That's quite important. If it's a complex case, say it's a complex case. Don't go into... Uh, complex surgery without actually acknowledging that this is not uh, some your routine bog uh, standard uh, arthroscopy procedure. Yeah. Um, can I ask you one more question, if you don't mind? This sure. is for my learning. Um, the pyrocarbons, how do they, how are they attached to their stems? I always thought they were very difficult to attach to a prosthesis. Uh, no, it's exactly the same. It's the Morse taper. Um, the, yeah, so the, the pyrocarbon research all comes out of the uh, university in Brisbane where uh, an academic developed the, the, the technology to create pyrocarbon and they've done most of the research on it. So in the Aussie registry, it's incredibly popular, but there have been some issues. There's one implant that's been, uh, that's had MHRA approval withdrawn. There was one implant, I think that, had, that suffered with fractures, but um, generally speaking uh, in the basic science studies that have been done, it's very favorable in terms of cartilage wear 
And mm-hmm. so you got to remember these patients, they're 30, 40, 50 years old, looking down the barrel of an arthroplasty. Mm-hmm. You, you want to do something that is easy to revise, that isn't going to be destructive in terms of humeral bone and glenoid bone. And so for most people with AVN, if you catch them at the right time where they've got collapse, but they haven't got degenerative changes, and they do quite well with a, with a pyrocarbon hemi. And then it's really dealer's choice about whether you do a stemless, a resurfacing, or a short stem. Most people are going for short stem because actually the short stem are very narrow as well. So they're actually, you actually lose less bone when you excise that versus a stemless, which is actually a, a corral that fits into the metaphysis and almost occupies all of the metaphysis at that level. Mm. Um, and a resurfacing is also an option, but it's completely fallen out of favor in the NJR okay. because it's technically quite challenging, a bit like a hip resurfacing, but technically very challenging to get right. So people have abandoned that uh, in yeah. the main. And the pipe carbon is still is now not an experimental uh, stem. No, it's been around for about ten years, and there's only two companies in the in the NHS supply chain that provide a pyrocarbon heavy. The commonest one is the one that is also the number one rated shoulder replacement system in the world and in the UK. So, it, it, surgeons are familiar with the actual steps of the operation. It's the only difference is the bearing surface is uh, is pyrocarbon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's probably my experience of pyrocarbons, which was ten years ago. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. Um, if there's no other uh, questions from the participants, um, we will stop the recording part of our section now. Um, unless there's anything more you wish to add, uh, uh, Rashid. Uh, no, the only thing I would say is, you know, shoulder cases are not that common in the exam. So, you know, I, I didn't revise that, mu- that much shoulder stuff, but there is stuff that does come up regularly over and over again. Locked posterior dislocation comes up a lot in the trauma viva, it comes up a lot in the upper limb viva. Um, and uh, CC, you know, ACJ dislocation, for some reason, I don't think it's that important of a pathology for, for every orthopod in, in the UK to know that much about. But for some reason, it lends itself well to a lot of questions on principles, anatomy, biomechanics, treatment options. So that, that's, a, that's a common one as well. Oh, uh, that actually reminds me to uh, an, another very important point you made. Um, again, in terms of technique, yes, they, you technically don't need to know classification systems, but the point of the classification systems is to work out your management plan. So if you understand at least where the change in management plan happens in the classification system, you're already on a runner. Um, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most good classifications that people will hint at you maybe giving an answer on will be ones that have a good basic science basis that um, explains that you understand the, the, the pathology and the biomechanics of the what's going on. And so even if you don't remember the name of the person or the grades, just say the principles are as follows, which basically is the classification. The examiner will often say, yeah, actually that is the classification. You just described it, even though you don't know the name of it, because there's ways around that. But I, I would say you know, there's a few myths. I'll talk about this in my next session in a few weeks. There are a few FRCS myths, and one of them is you don't need to know evidence and you don't need to know classifications. Those are true. You can get a six without knowing either of those things, but your goal should not be to get a six in every station because if you do that, all you need is one five and you'll fail. And so if you can remember some classifications, some evidence to get yourself the odd seven, then it buys you some buffer in the bank for you to get a five and something that you don't know as much about. Um, so I, I, would, I wouldn't shy away from learning that. I would just say, um, you know, learn the basic stuff that's going to get you what, where you're going to get to for a six. And then if you know a little bit more about the topic, introduce the other stuff later. Because that's not going to hurt you. Perfect. Um, I'm not sure. There's a question. How about frozen shoulder cases in the exam? I'm not sure what that question means. because you. Yeah, frozen shoulder. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, I've briefly talked about it, but essentially, you know, lack of uh, passive external rotation. And you want to ask them just some very simple stuff. Uh, you want to ask them whether they have pain at rest or whether they have pain at the end of their range. And that's very different. If they have pain at rest, then they tend to be in the inflammatory phase. And they tend to do better with steroid injection or hydro distension. If they're, if they're not painful, if they just get pain when they stretch their capsule to the end of its range, and they get that proprioceptive feedback and they get that sharp pain, 
then that's not as an inflamed of a capsule, that's more of a fibrotic thickened capsule. And then you may wish to do a hydrogen tension, maybe even an MUA, maybe even a capsular release. But the mainstay of treatment for these patients, it's a self-limiting condition, and it is something that's managed with um, hydrogen tension, injection, observation, and physiotherapy. Um, one one thing too, it's not so important now because post COVID we don't have patients to examine. But um, if you if you are if we do go back to that situation after COVID in the summer finishes, touch wood, um, the if someone has a symptom which you know is very painful, or a condition sorry a presentation which is very painful, please be careful in your examination even show care that you don't want to hurt the patient and say, are you sure you want me to do this? And because it will hurt the patient. And when you do, when they say, yes, yeah. do it, still do it to the minimum uh, and watch the patient's yeah. face for pain because these patients are turning up to your exam, not for your clinical expertise. They're turning up to the exam to help, to be nice to you. And if you hurt them, yeah. almost like, it's an automatic yeah. fail, I'm going to say. Yeah, it's, it's the same for like the rheumatoid hand. You know, you, you do your whole room until hand station without touching the patient Absolutely. in the exam, you know, pre-COVID. Because you don't need to, right? You know it's going to be painful. They can tell you which joints are painful. And so there's nothing to be gained by showing the exam that you can press on someone's painful joint and cause them pain. So just don't do it. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to stop the recording there.